Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. This addition to Insider's Guide to Energy is brought to you by Fidectus. Go to www.fidectus.com for more information. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and with me is co-host, Johan Oberg. Johan, what's going on this week? Afternoon, Chris. Uh, another great week. Another energy-intensive week, as always. But some positive... You said a great week in energy-intensive. If you were a gas trader, would you be saying those same things to me today? No, but I... I no, you're right. You're right. But there are... I was, was coming to... There are lights also in this darkness or this tunnel as well. And, and you know that my previous company, we recently opened up the... Uh, the big hydro park or the hydro one in Notre Dame in, in the valley of Switzerland. And it was great to see all my old colleagues visiting this massive, was it $1.9 billion investment. So, so this, I, I had to say there's good things happening as well. <laughs> yeah. I think there's been interesting things happening. You know, Uniper was an interesting news story that just went by that. That's a bit different of what, what might've been expected. All industry insiders probably would have predicted that was coming anyway. Um, but it's been an interesting week. Um, I am excited about today's show, particularly uh, we had this guest on our future energy leaders conversations. He was talking with uh, many master students on a call. We had great conversations about hydrogen and very interactive, but I'm really excited to have him on the show and the main show, because we're going to talk about some things that are happening in the markets today that are going to be interesting. It's timely with this episode this week. Um, I don't know. I, you haven't talked to Jeff yet. Do you have any expectations of what we're going to do today? There's a few things. One, I think, it's, I think we're going to look forward to a really fascinating person in general, a thought leader. He runs his own podcast. He attends well, that, a lot. That of makes him good all, right off the bat. We, yeah, we but like I podcasters because we know you have to be bright to run a podcast. Absolutely. But I, I have to say there's another thing as well, and there's specifically towards this company. It's one of my, you know, I wouldn't say childhood memories, but early adult life uh, memories. I, I moved to the US and started university and up the road from the university was the headquarters of this company back in the days. And it's always kind of stuck with me of, of US and this company as kind of the size, the scale and, and the opportunities. And what available. company is this company? It's called GE, I think. <laughs> it's GE. Well, I think you and I could talk for hours. We do anyway. So let's bring our guest on the show and, and, and bring him into the conversation. Jeff Goldmere, welcome to the program. Chris, Johan, thanks for having me. So he said GE, but I'm pretty sure you're GE Power or something else. So maybe it makes sense for you to tell our guests who Jeff is and where Jeff works. Um, great. So Jeff Goldmere, I uh, officially work in GE Gas Power. So that's the gas turbine division of the company. Uh, I'm based in a little town called Schenectady, New York, the uh, the home of General Electric. This is a uh, the town where uh, Thomas Edison founded the company over 100 years ago. Um, so the gas turbine division, right, we supply gas turbines for, for power applications all over the world. But that's part of a larger portion of the company. It's part of our, our power enterprise. And that's um, what's going to become in early 2024 what GE has announced, uh, this, this new investment grade uh, company called GE Vernova. GE Vernova. And, and so... They just announced this or recently announced this is coming out. What, what exactly is a GE Vernoma, Vernova? So, so the, the company is basically going to be split into three independent uh, investment grade companies. The first will be GE Healthcare. That's going to be spun off uh, as of January 1st, 2023. And then GE Aerospace, so our aircraft engines business is renaming themselves um, Aerospace, give a broader vision. And then the portfolio of energy businesses are all going to come together under the Renova name. And so that includes our renewables business, uh, our grid solutions business, our power business, which is all um, things steam and nuclear. And so all those businesses, including the gas turbine business, will come together under this new uh, this new name, Renova. 
which is really meant to focus on right there for, for green. We're thinking about the future of energy and, and Nova meaning new. So we're really focused on this on this new green, cleaner, decarbonized energy future. Which was interesting because that was my follow up question. What does it actually Vernova means? Uh, <laughs> so so uh, great. But where, where do you see yourself um, in terms of uh, your specific area? Then we talked about we touched a little bit on the hydrogen and the gas turbines, uh, but on a broader scale, what would where do you sit then? So so um, metaphysically speaking, not literally. <laughs> um, so again, I I, I, I I work in the gas power business, and so my role. Uh, as an emerging uh, technology uh, leader, is to really help the company think about the future. And, and my technical background is is I'm a mechanical engineer by by formal education, um, but my technical experience and through my education has been combustion. So I've been one of these guys in the lab, you know, burning stuff. The, the people you want kind of on the far end of the campus in case something goes wrong. Um, you don't want the combustion lab, let's say, next to the president's office, typically at a university. Um, so I've been doing combustion uh, was part of my technical, you know, kind of career path. So I, I'm leveraging that technical knowledge around combustion and fuels to help our customers understand what are the fuels that we can use as we think about this decarbonized future. So a lot of discussion around hydrogen, uh, you know, as we think about it as a zero carbon fuel, there's a lot of chatter now growing about other, let's call them zero or low carbon intensity fuels, whether it's a biofuel, a synthetic or renewable natural gas. There's a bunch of chatter about ammonia. So my job is really to help our customers think about this, but also fundamentally to help our leadership, right? What's the strategic direction that GE should be taking, you know, in this space? Um, and then there's the larger pictures. We think about hydrogen and other low carbon fuels. What does that mean? You know, as we think about how do we produce those fuels and, and are there technologies that GE can bring to bear as we think about that entire value chain um, just like GE for years supported the oil and gas industry. We weren't oil and gas providers, but we supported that industry with critical technology. Is it something we would do in this new energy space? So is this still, you, go ahead. Go would ahead. you still have, would you still then have a focus on the oil and gas as well under the Vinova or is that in a separate area now? So, so the traditional space around oil and gas, so, you know, long history. So GE had acquired a, an Italian company, Nova Pignone years ago. Um, and then through other acquisitions, we we basically had the Baker Hughes entity, which included Nova Pignone, which really was our business arm that worked with the oil and gas industry. Well, Baker Hughes is now a separate company. And so, so GE really doesn't specifically support the oil and gas industry anymore, although uh, we do throw do so through, through Baker Hughes, because many of our gas turbines are still heavily used in the oil and gas industry. You know, we have gas turbines that are uh, involved in LNG compression trains. And so we, we, our technology does support it. Um, you know, but the question becomes, does hydrogen become, let's say the new oil and gas and this new future? And then how do we support that, that new growth industry? So you're breaking off into a vertical. They've, they've separated this, this energy vertical out. You're talking about a lot of futures here. You know, I, I noticed a lot of future tense words in your, you know, does this, we're going to do this. Where are you today on the journey? Oh, um, the, the journey is in an awesome place. So, you know, one of the things that, that we talk about internally is, is we use phrases like decade of action, but we also talk about things like steel in the ground. Like, what are we doing today that's real, that's concrete? And so let me give you two examples from, from just this year um, with, with our customers. So we worked with a, a customer, Long Ridge Energy. They're in um, Eastern Ohio. Uh, their power plant is in Hannibal, Ohio. So it actually sits on the Ohio River, in which is the border between Ohio and West Virginia. Uh, this is a 7HAO2 power plant. It's a 485 megawatt combined cycle power plant. Um, and um, we we did a demonstration with this customer where we where we blended in 5% uh, hydrogen into their existing gas turbine, demonstrating that on, you know, even on a large, um, on a large power plant, you can blend hydrogen in. And um, so that was a great demonstration. They actually demonstrated that in April and uh, they provided some information to the public. So, right, existing power plant, 5% hydrogen by volume, we changed nothing on the plant. Yeah, 
So, so two projects I want to I want to highlight that are that are really relevant from this year. The first is a project we did with a customer in Ohio, it's Long Ridge Energy Terminal. Their power plant is on the uh, western side of the Ohio River, which is the border between Ohio and West Virginia. It's a 485 megawatt combined cycle power plant, and we operated the power plant on a 5% blend of hydrogen and natural gas. Uh, they did a public demonstration. Um, and when I say 5% by volume, I want to be clear, that's not a limit of the gas turbine. That was just, you know, a 485 megawatt combined cycle plant, you know, 5% hydrogen is still a large amount. Um, but that was a great demonstration. Um, just announced literally hours ago um, is a project that we did this spring um, with the New York Power Authority on a, a very different type of gas turbine. This was on a, a 44 uh, megawatt aero derivative. So aero derivatives for you know, listeners who, who may not be aware of it, think about taking the core of an aircraft engine, in this case, the core of a 747 aircraft engine, but now you don't want it to make thrust, you want it to make power. So now you connect up the appropriate turbine equipment so that you're not generating thrust, you, you're spinning a, a turbine and you're connecting that to a generator. Um, we ran a project this summer um, that was uh, also um, uh, supported by the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI. They've got uh, an initiative they call the Low Carbon Resource Initiative. And so between GE and EPRI and the York Power Authority, NIPA, we ran that gas turbine on a blend of hydrogen and natural gas, and we went up to just above 40% hydrogen. So is, and, is that part of the strategy then that you see is an incremental step forward? So just reducing the amount of hydrocarbon you're burning and releasing, is that what this is doing? Or what are we learning by you getting 40% hydrogen? That these will be running in hydrogen one day or that we're just less emissions? So I, I think it's a combination of that. So, so first of all, today we couldn't do 100% hydrogen on these gas turbines mostly because there isn't supply of hydrogen. And so part of this is, okay, so with the supply limits we have today, what can we do, number one? And so that's that's the blended operation. But the truth is, as we develop our infrastructure, we're not gonna go from zero low carbon hydrogen to all the low carbon hydrogen we ever need. There'll be supply limits. So we likely expect you'll see these blending operations over time as the supply of this hydrogen expands. But there's also really important learnings. So, you know, we, we constantly get questions and people saying, well, hey, if you're burning hydrogen, you know, in, in a laboratory, in an unconstrained environment, you'll make more NOx. And so that makes people worried. But in this particular demonstration that we did with the New York Power Authority, we showed that not only can you run that blend of hydrogen, we were able to, to demonstrate that you could keep the NOx emissions at the permit level which is really, really important. So it's so we're actually getting real important technical learnings that we're sharing with the public. It's not just doing for the sake of doing. So if we look, I love the, the two examples, by the way, because I think there is a transition that we're on the way and if we can do the steps, uh, the stake in the ground as well, because we talk a lot about uh, what will come and how we will change this. Uh, but I will actually follow up on that question and what will come. <laughs> and that is if we talk about hydrogen in general uh, and, and the cases, where do you see, be that we have, I wouldn't say unlimited, but more more hydrogen being produced, where where, where would you see the new uh, applications that where, where you would kind of look into? I guess there's a number of things, but where would you see the ones that really stick out? And, and here's where you where the next step will be. Well, I think you've got a segment, you know, because there are obviously places that hydrogen could go. You can think about transportation, you can think about flight, you can think about power, chemicals. I think, honestly, the, the first place we may see what's called low carbon hydrogen is to replace very high carbon footprint hydrogen. So ammonia production, the oil and gas sector. So I think that's a potential likely place to see some large volumes of hydrogen initially, because frankly, they're the users of it already. But then the question becomes, okay, where would you see hydrogen go next? And I think part of that answer is, where does it buy its way in? Where does it have a, a price point that's comparable to maybe the price you might see of the of the of the default? So if it's if it's transportation, is it um, you know does it buy its way on versus gasoline or diesel or a battery? You know, in the in the power sector. Right. When does it become reasonably price competitive to natural gas? Um, and, and again, you know, we think about what's happening globally in terms of policy that, again, makes this very relevant, uh, relevant. 
you know, just weeks ago, the U.S. government um, signed into law this Inflation Reduction Act, which carries huge new subsidies for hydrogen. There's the first time ever what's called 45V. It's a tax credit. It's actually a production tax credit for hydrogen. If you meet all the requirements for having low carbon intensity, there's some other prevailing wage and other requirements. But if you meet those requirements for up to 10 years, you can get a tax credit of $3 a kilogram. That's about $22 per million BTU. And what's even more interesting for certain entities for the first five years, it's not just a tax credit, it's a direct pay. Meaning even if you don't have tax equity, you know, you submit your tax returns and you get a refund effectively from the US government. So this is going to put huge subsidies into this space for not just the production of hydrogen, but if you take hydrogen and store it for use for energy, you can claim an energy storage tax credit. If you are using wind because there's a, a wind production tax credit, so you could use electricity that's being subsidized with a with a PTC to make low carbon hydrogen if you're doing it via electrolysis. So the U.S. has created this scenario where there's this potential for, for very, very large subsidies, which could drive the cost of hydrogen down. And if you do so, do we see the adoption of hydrogen in some spaces that maybe we thought was going to take a longer time frame and it's going to spur production because there's going to be interest? So I think we're kind of in this very interesting transition period now where people are racing to make these investments, to create these this create demand. Right. You've, you, and, and if there's demand, then maybe there'll be supply. So it's going to be very interesting. But, but do, you, do, you see a, do you see a risk in this as well? We talked a lot about subsidies before, and we've got the wind market in, in Europe specifically around this. But do you also see a risk that it's not clear enough and it becomes short term rather than long term? So you build your business case around subsidies rather than a long term case. And if it's unsecure, I guess that's yeah. a little bit of a concern. Well, I, look, I think about, you know, the, the power industry where sometimes people are going to so sign long-term fuel contracts. So I think, you know, the, the, especially in the power industry, they're very sensitive to the price of fuel. And so I think they're going to be looking at what does this mean long-term? And obviously long-term is, is different for different industries, but, you know, this tax, this tax credit has a 10-year horizon. So, you know, you basically get it for 10 years. What's interesting, however, is you look at the specific language is, the tax credit is available, meaning you can start claiming the tax credit up to, I think it's 2030 or 2032. So if you build your facility in 2030 and it starts operating in 2031, you can get your tax credit, I believe, for 10 years, either five or 10 years past that date. So this is not something that just disappears in two or three years. We're talking about at least a decade. And that may be enough to get the ball rolling, that the costs start to come down, that even after the subsidies go away, we don't just jump right back up to the level we were pre-subsidy because part of the issue is, is there enough manufacturing capacity for electrolyzers? How, you know, is there enough hydrogen infrastructure? And and speaking of infrastructure, you know, what's, what's really, again, so timely, uh, yesterday afternoon, the U.S. Department of Energy released the funding opportunity announcement. It's U.S. government lingo. It's basically the RFP for the previously announced clean or regional clean hydrogen hubs. So the DOE releasing that yesterday basically has started the stopwatch that people are now going to be working very specifically on the, the DOE's put a new structure in place. You have to submit a concept paper by the, I think it's the 7th of November, and then full proposals for that program will be due um, uh, end of first quarter, beginning of second quarter next year. And you know, these are the hubs where people talk about $8 billion of U.S. government investment. So not only do we have these subsidies uh, which were just announced a few weeks ago, but now we've got this funding announcement tied to billions of dollars uh, of U.S. investment in infrastructure. So it's, like I said, we're, we're entering this really interesting transition period in this space. So where does GE play in? So GE's been in the business to make everything from aircraft engines. You know, as you said, you were talking about how they repurpose aircraft engines and in, 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 even in oil and other industries, aircraft engines have been around for a long time as part of solutions. Um, where do you fit in in the hydrogen game? So, you know, I've heard you speak hydrogen. You've been doing hydrogen a really long time personally. Um, how is GE teed up for this? So, so let's, let's think about this um, a, a, as the hydrogen value chain, right? If you're going to go make low carbon hydrogen and you want to electrolyze water, well, first thing is you need a low carbon electron. 
Where's that low carbon electron coming from? Solar or wind or hydro. And, you know, GE has a, has a great renewables business. Um, you know, we have the world's largest offshore wind turbine, I believe it is the Halley X, right? Our prototype is out in the Port of Rotterdam. So as we think about, so you need to source, you need to source a lot of low carbon electricity. And so, great. Well, then you got to figure out how to move that electricity. Uh, you know, in the US, we, we talk about how there's really places with just amazing wind. Problem is, no one lives there <laughs> because they're in these very desolated places, uh, isolated places. And so we need to put in new infrastructure and you need to manage that flow of electricity. So our grid solutions business comes into play, you know, especially if you start thinking about these scenarios, maybe where you have, um, you know, people talk about, well, we'll start doing offshore wind to make hydrogen, or we're going to do, uh, you know, we're going to have wind and solar in the mountains of Chile because it, the, the, the capacity factors are really high. Well, now you have to think about microgrids or mini grids. If you're going to have these wind turbines kind of sitting there, not connected to a grid. So how do you control those systems? So, you know, I look at GE and I look at these technologies we've developed, you know, for, for many, many years, and, and they're very applicable into some of these challenges that we're going to have in that new energy space, not just on the consumption of the hydrogen, but we've got some technologies we can help provide. Um, you know, you just mentioned Johan, right? The, a new hydroelectric dam, well, geez, and maybe it's the same project. Um, you know, this new hydro, this new hydroelectric uh, facility in Switzerland um, that was just inaugurated a few weeks ago, that's got, uh, you know, the GE Hydro business, some of our equipment there. So, you know, we really are, are really excited about providing, you know, again, key equipment into into this value chain. And I, that's, I draw this, this, this similarity as we think about the oil and gas industry, we'd always think about upstream, midstream, downstream. Well, you could think about the same thing in this new energy world of what are the upstream technologies, the midstream technologies, who are the end users? And we need, you know, new technologies in those segments. And, and that's where I think GE can come to play with some of our great technology. Which I think it's interesting and, and reading a little bit about it and also worked with GE in the past uh, on, on your digital, uh, GE digital for, for a few years ago. I think it's a lot about these ecosystems and, and how you build it. And I guess with an organization like GE, you build one is almost your internal ecosystem between the businesses because they complement each other in many ways. But where do you see the biggest opportunities moving forward? Because we're also in a transition. Uh, we're in a transformation industries so where do you see the green fields or the, the partners that you think will help you to t to elevate to the next steps because ge as big it is as much resource it has it hasn't everything so what, what are kind of missing part of the puzzle in order to, to take that next step well i mean look we are fundamentally uh technology providers right we are not the utility we're not the developer so we need our commercial partners in this space you know, who's going to go build that wind farm? Who's going to go decide where it goes? Um, how do you bring all of this together? Uh, we need policymakers to create the right policies that will help this. I mean, it's the work that's being done in Europe right now in the U.S. is fantastic. You know, the challenge we see, and I'll, I'll be very power specific at the moment, you know, customers say, so let's, you know, we have access to hydrogen, but so we want to go put it into our turbine. Gee, you told us it's technically viable and we'll say yes to all of that. The problem is today, hydrogen costs multiple times what natural gas does. And the electricity markets today aren't valuing the low carbon nature of that electron. What they're looking at is a very traditional capital market structure, electricity prices. You know, they want to drive the lowest cost of electricity into the system. And so in this future, we need to figure out how do we at the same time have a reliable grid and a sustainable grid. You know, but by sustainable, low carbon. So how do we create the policies that drive not just the technology development, but the adoption of that technology that, you know, so I think there's a lot of stuff that, that goes on that's just beyond just the technology development. We've got to have the right policy structure to influence and incentivize the adoption of these technologies, have to have the right, you know, kind of investment and capital structure and kind of people wanting to go do it. And, and we can we can provide help to all those folks, but we're not you know the prime in the in those examples. Is hydrogen ready for prime time yet? I mean, the energy density and some of the other things for some of the uses you described. You know, I'm not expecting to hop on a hydrogen jet anytime soon. Um, 
is it ready? I mean, you, you gave some use cases where, yes, it, it brings value apparently fairly immediately if the cost structure works, but infrastructure wise, development wise, are we ready to use it? Oh, I, I think we are. If we're talking about kind of, you know, everyday societal adoption where you get out, you, you know, you walk out of your house and there's your fuel cell vehicle and, you know, the Amazon truck that dropped off a package at your house was a fuel cell, you know, hydrogen fuel cell powered vehicle. And that package was delivered on a, a you know, a hydrogen powered airplane. Uh, the infrastructure doesn't exist for that large scale economic transition today. You know, there, there are companies out there providing uh, hydrogen fuel cells or electrolyzers at, at, you know, not tiny scale, but, you know, they're supplying, you know, a fleet of vehicles or, you know, uh, you know, vehicles for a factory installation. Um, we don't yet have jet engines that can run on hydrogen, you know, and it's not clear that what the right, um, you know, which segment of the flight industry of the aviation industry will use hydrogen. It's not clear that you'll have, you know, these long haul intercontinental, you know, flights, you know, think, you know, New York to London or, you know, New York to, to Dubai or Delhi or London to Sydney. It's not clear that the mass of hydrogen, all the infrastructure and auxiliaries you need on the airplane to keep, maybe to have liquid hydrogen will make sense. You know, maybe long haul flight won't ever be hydrogen, but I definitely think there are, we are starting to see those smaller use cases of hydrogen building. But part of it is you need the infrastructure. Where does the hydrogen come from? Who's your end user? And how do you connect A to B, right? What's the pipe? What's the wire? If, you know, you're going to do electrolysis on site because you're going to make a hydrogen for, a, you know, a small uh, fleet of fuel cell powered vehicles. Okay, you can have an electrolyzer on site, but do you have the right power transmission capacity coming into your site? Do you have access to all the water that you need for that? How are you storing the hydrogen? So we're not quite there yet. But, you know, I, I, this is kind of a crawl, walk, run, and we're, we're, we're not running. You know, some might argue we're not walking yet, but I'm okay with that because we're really starting to figure out what it takes to build this. So we're, we're early in that journey. Um, but part of this, we got to go do. And doing means we're learning and we're figuring out what we don't know yet. Um, and that's okay because as engineers and technologists, we'll go, we'll find a challenge and we'll, we'll come up with answers. So speaking of one of the challenges that come to mind, you, you talked about having offshore wind and being in the wind industry where, where perhaps you would have water and electricity that's renewable. Um, what kind of solutions are you seeing to transport the hydrogen? Is it hydrogen? Is it another gas that you're transporting? What, what are you doing or what are you thinking the future of moving hydrogen around is like? Or are we seeing it, you know, just, you know, replacing bunker fuel because it happens to be made at the water? I mean... You know, a lot of this will depend on the distance you're talking about. You know, you're making the hydrogen at point A and you want it at point B. Was point B around the corner? Is it, you know, a couple hundred miles away or is it, you know, thousands of miles away? And I think that the answer depends on which of those scenarios you're talking about. If it's, I've made it and I'm going to use it again locally, I'll probably just compress it as a gas because that's, 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 you know, it takes energy, but okay. If I want to go store it for long periods of time or I'm moving it long distances, I, I might think about um, cooling it cryogenically and compressing it. Um, it's, it takes a lot of energy to do that. Um, it takes roughly about a, for every kilogram of hydrogen you'd, you'd compress to a liquid, you consume roughly like the equivalent of a third of its heating value because you've got to get it down to minus 250 degrees C. Um, you know, for the non-technical people, I remind them that's 20 degrees above the temperature of space. It's 20 degrees above absolute zero. You know, it's really freaking cold. So it takes a lot of work to do that. And it doesn't always make sense. Uh, it, but if you're going to transport it very long distances, that, that's where people first started. Hey, let's move it as a cryogenic liquid because you get high energy density. When people start looking at the cost of, of compressing it and keeping it compressed, and obviously there's loss from boil off. This is when folks start saying, well, what are the other kind of energy dense molecules with hydrogen? Now, of course, one of the greatest, um, most used energy dense molecules with hydrogen is methane, but we want to move away from hydrocarbons. Okay, so what's the next alternative? Um, and this is where you hear people talking about ammonia. Ammonia is NH3, so it's carbon free. Um, something like 20 million tons of ammonia are, are shipped around the world today. Um, that's like 20% of the world's total ammonia production. So we know how to make ammonia. 
you know to transport ammonia it condenses at minus 33 degrees c so you know much warmer than hydrogen actually even much warmer than lng um and um so you know the, the so the marine industry is very interested in ammonia because they've got to move away from bunker fuel and you know the question becomes well, if the uh if the, if the marine industry moves away from bunker fuel and goes to ammonia and they're going to use it well doesn't it make it that much easier just to start moving hydrogen as ammonia around the world? So I think the answer to your question, you know, how do you move it really depends on, on where is it going, how far, but that long distance shipping uh, of, of fuels, you think about Japan, right? They import coal and LNG and, and their national plans are like, well, we have to move away from that. So they're now thinking, what is the, 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 car the carbon free molecule they'll import that's, you know, is it hydrogen, is it ammonia? Um, and so there's a lot of thought happening around the world in this space. But it feels, which is, which is great, of course, and I think this is part of the, the, the whole thing. And we, we discussed on the show earlier as well in terms of uh, the marine industry and especially the freight uh, or freight in, in, in terms of marines where you actually have the basis. It's a little bit easier than to build it. But we're also coming across... We're approaching 2030, <laughs> we're approaching 2050, all these goals are supposed to be there, the Inflation Act is coming with quite steep and, and, and hefty targets in, in terms of timelines. And it feels like the technology in, in theory could be there, but there's a lot of different steps. So is this testing and testing and probably not, or is it viable to actually make it? Because transport is a big Storage and transport are the big kind of things. And I think you're going to start hearing more about the transport and storage piece um, because, because regardless of, of how we go through the energy transition, whether we're talking about electricity, whether we're talking a molecule, you know, we need to invest in infrastructure significantly around the world. You know, you, you, you think about how much renewable electricity has to be added to our grid collectively. Um, you know, we need new infrastructure to move that electricity. Um, you know, in the U.S., uh, the Midwest uh, ISO, uh, their board just approved something like a $10 billion investment over the next, I forget how many years it is, for recognition that they need to increase their ability to move this electricity from where it's being generated to the demand centers and, and do so intelligently and, and, and you know, with reliably. So, I think the infrastructure piece of this should not be discounted. It's, I think, really the pacing portion of this because now if you start talking, well, let's do, um, let's make hydrogen, but using carbon capture, or I'm going to use carbon capture in the steel industry. Well, okay, you need to move that CO2 somewhere. So you need the, that infrastructure of moving the CO2. So I think regardless of which pathway you go down in this future of energy, whether it's hydrogen or CCS or electricity or combinations of those, we need that new infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I remind people that the electric grid that that many of us live with today in, in the U.S. and Europe, you know, developed over the last century. It, it just did not pop out of the ground ten years ago. So we should not expect that the new infrastructure will be here tomorrow. It, it will take a decade or two to transition there, um, but we've got to create the baby steps and figure out what the foundations for that will be. So, as a as a European and, and not. <laughs> specifically clued up on everything on the US NEE part. It's a century something we build a grid and the same thing in Europe, usually from governments and from, from fundings from, from cities and, and, and the innovation was around it with, with private corporations, etc. Who will build the infrastructure? Because we've had on the show many times about storage. We've had about all the innovation technologies. We had about all this, the, the different ways of addressing the energy transition, but it comes down to many, many times around if and when we have the uh, the, the right infrastructure. But I still haven't heard uh, who's going to build the infrastructure. At least let, let me speak to, I think, on the energy storage piece. Um, I think it's going to be the same industry that's done it so far. I mean, it's going to be the power industry. Um, you know, you look at California, California, I forget, you know, has, has, has a significant amount of, of energy storage that's been added to the grid in the last few years. Um, that's private industry, you know, because they see a need for it. And yes, is there potentially some, some sponsorship or subsidy provided by the government, but who's actually, you know, shovel in the ground, breaking the ground, building it, it it's private industry. So I think at least on the storage piece, 
that's what we're going to continue to see. Now, on the transmission side, it gets it does get a little more complicated because now you've got you got the the ISOs, but they don't actually own the equipment. It, it gets a little more complicated, um, and de- and not an area I have 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 great expertise in. But on the storage side, I definitely see that folks are thinking about you know, especially when because the the electricity providers are being asked to think about well, if your asset goes down. How you providing that, or you know, other alternatives to supporting? You're adding these renewables. I can think about what's happening in the UK, and similarly, right in the UK, there's conversations about well, if you're adding all these renewables, you know, you know, is someone putting a central storage system in, or are you being asked, not you personally, you hunt, but right, are the developers for these wind farms being asked to basically create the redundancy, um, you know, that backs up their own wind? So I, I think there's a lot of discussion about what this is going to be, but what I don't think we're seeing globally is that the governments are owning that and energy storage is going to the developer, the utility, you know, the private industry to really to build that capacity. So despite whoever's going to build it, let's talk about the storage. What does that mean at scale with hydrogen? Help me understand. I, I don't know hydrogen well, so I'm asking kind of silly questions, but you, you talk about storage and you mentioned it in early in the conversation as well. So if I'm, let's say one of our listeners, I'm a power company, like Johan talked about, you know, in a, in a large power company where he came from, um, how do I do grid scale storage and what is hydrogen going to do for me there? So, so let me talk about kind of, at least in my mind, how I envision hydrogen potentially being used in, in this net zero 2050 kind of scenario that we think about globally. So imagine a world that's got a very large amount of renewables, 80, 90%, pick your favorite number. Um, but there'll be periods where for whatever reason, there isn't a lot of wind, there isn't a lot of, of sun. Um, obviously there are parts of the world in the extreme latitudes, right? You know, North, Northern Southern hemispheres where part of the year, there just isn't a lot of sun. Um, like you know, uh, I live in upstate New York and, uh, you know, December and January can be very dark, cloudy months, not necessarily the best place for solar. Um, but you know what happens during those periods where you have an extended uh, kind of winter solar drought. You know, if it's a couple hours, you know, batteries will cover that load. That's not a problem. But you still need big batteries because now you're not talking about our houses or the school. We're talking about you know Paris, London, Rome kind of scale. Um, you know, pumped hydro is is a great you know energy storage system that gets you large volume because now you're. Capacity is really just a function of how big your reservoir is. But, you know, ultimately, you know, what really concerns me in these scenarios is what happens when you have, let's say, four to five days of of an extreme scenario where there's really not any renewables. Your, your batteries will be completely discharged. Um, as much pumped hydro as there in, in the world today, it's a fraction of what demand of electricity would be. So what do you do? So to me... This is where molecules come in. Molecules provide you with long-term storage. You know, molecules don't break down. So whether you think of your molecules, hydrogen or ammonia or ethanol or methanol, or today our our largest energy storage system is methane, right? We have methane stored all over the world. But now imagine you have a molecule and when you have these periods of extended, um, you know, kind of renewable drought, you can open the valve in your storage reservoir. And now that molecule flows to your, to your, to your turbines or your fuel cells. The question just becomes, okay, what scale do you need that to be? And, you know, we think about for natural gas, we have cavern based storage, you know, which provides you massive amounts of storage. And I think, you know, we're have to th- have to think about if we're going to use hydrogen, or other molecules as energy storage to use, you know, two or three times a year for those four or five days when you just don't have enough renewables, you need large scale storage. Um, and again, there are some benefits to moving hydrogen to a liquid, um, whether it's hydrogen as, as a as a cryogenically cooled liquid or ammonia or something else, because then you get great energy density. But there are some companies out there that, that do cavern based storage. Um, the industrial gas companies down in the U.S. Gulf Coast, they actually store hydrogen in caverns underground. Why? Because if their production facility, right, they're under contract to provide hydrogen to folks. If their production facility goes down either for planned or unplanned maintenance, they still have to provide that hydrogen. So they use that. They, I think they have, I've read somewhere, you know, one of the industrial gas companies has like 30 days of hydrogen stored in an underground cavern to provide to their customers should their plant go down. Now, not everyone's going to have that geology, but there'll be places around the world where you can do that. 
There are companies that are exploring that geology. There are companies looking at how could you create, you know, small scale hydrogen storage. So maybe at any individual power plant, you could have kind of a couple of days of hydrogen stored. Um, um, but um, yeah, it, I, I think we have to think about, you know, long duration energy storage. And that's how I think of hydrogen as a molecule, right? It gives us the ability to do those things, um, you know, where, where batteries just couldn't do it. So do you see hydrogen as a fuel cell or something like that at the home generator? So instead of having a propane or diesel generator to back up my house in upstate New York, when a snowstorm rolls through or something like that, am I going to have a little hydrogen storage on my property? I, I don't know. But I mean, you think about California that is, you know, talking about basically outlawing, you know, even small combustion engines for, uh, you know, for, for lawn maintenance. So um, I definitely think that, um, you know, if you're in the business of, of, of providing, you know, small scale, you know, backup generators for folks homes, you know, is that going to be a, a high, some sort of hydrogen tank next to a, a fuel cell um, in the future? Maybe, um, you know, uh, unless it's, um, you know, unless you've got an, a lot of solar on your property and you've got a battery and you've got enough, you know, days of battery power stored up. But yeah, I think, you know, those are some of the models you have to think through if you're, um, you know, think about institutions that have critical need for 24 seven power hospitals and, and other places, you know, what is going to be the backup power that they're going to rely upon? Is it going to be, you know, uh, a tank of fuel with a fuel cell? Is it a battery? Is it some combination of those? But, you know, this is the kind of thinking that we're going to need in the future. Um, but, you know, today, again, we're just trying to figure out what are the basic building blocks we need for, for all of these systems. But um, this is all happening at once. So I, at least for me, it's really exciting because we're we're all kind of kind of plowing new ground together. So what about transportation? So so what I've heard is industry pundits talk about trucking and, and large large transportation maybe as a hydrogen play, less so, you know, taking my Tesla away or something like that. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on transportation? Uh, so, so my thoughts have been have been educated by uh, guests I've had on my podcast. So not being an, an expert of transportation myself, we've had uh, conversations with uh, J.B. Hunt, who is uh, the, the, one of the largest transportation companies in the U.S. Uh, we had uh, conversations with Proterra, which is an electric bus company, as well as uh, National Grid. And at least the, the sense I get is for personal home use kind of vehicles, EVs or hybrids are probably going to make a lot of sense. It's, it's when you start to get to large vehicles where the mass of the battery starts to impact the, the amount of cargo you can carry. So if you're long haul trucking, you know, what I've read is that at some point, you know, batteries get so large that you're now sacrificing a significant percentage of your cargo. And obviously, you know, the, the mass of the stuff they carry is, is, is how they get paid. Um, the other challenge that, that the industry is worried about from what I can tell is, is charging time. So if you've got a, a long haul EV, you know, how long is it going to take you to recharge that? Is it four hours? Is it six hours? Maybe you can do a quick charge in less than that. But if you're a fuel cell vehicle, you you pull up to the pump and, you know, 15 minutes later and you, you're, you're recharged for another couple hundred miles. So I think there's a lot of, of ongoing questions in the industry about, you know, are there kind of uh, swim lanes, if you will? Are there places where EVs are really going to do a much better job than this, than, than hydrogen and vice versa? But either way, Again, you think about the infrastructure. If you're thinking about, you know, you're in the long haul uh, shipping business and you've got trucks, whether they're crossing continental Europe or they're crossing continental US, okay, what does that future filling station look like? Are you going to have to be someplace that, you know, today you pull it and maybe there's there's conventional gasoline and then maybe there's um, there's diesel. But in the future, is there going to be some sort of, you know, one side will be EV stations and another side will be hydrogen stations? So, um We'll see. And I think that's I think that's a, something we heard as well from some of our other guests, and, and it's also something that I believe in, and that is sometimes you hear this. I wouldn't say a battle, but the, the differences of opinions between us, kind of in the energy industry. Okay, no, is EV is going to be on on batteries, or is going to be on this? Whereas, literally, we're a supplier to to the guys who are actually the OEMs who decides this, and I think that's where 
where, where something, at least I hear, where we lose the discussion sometimes because we think that the technology that we have is the best one, whereas the OEMs will look at the entire cycle of this. Okay, so what is the cost? What is the for this? So it's it's quite interesting, and and I I think I. I I, what I heard and I agree with is I think the smaller ones are almost uh, uh, game over. If you have an EV, it's going to be a battery or a hybrid one. But once it comes up to the large one, especially then coming out on, on sea as well in terms of marines and large trucks, I think that's where we what we heard uh, around it. Where, when it comes to, to that, when when you were working on, on these forward thinking, how, how much work do you do with the OEMs? And also the ones that, in terms of buildings or in terms of even small appliances, how is that relationship? You know, for us, our relationship with the GE is really with those people who are buying our equipment and putting the electricity out on the grid. So, um, you know, we no longer have the appliance business, um, although the, the name still is there. Um, but, you know, ultimately, our relationship is with those people who are buy, buying our electrical equipment, our generating equipment and putting electrons on the grid. Um, you know, and so it's really interesting, you know, we think about these models, is the power of the future going to be large centralized power stations? Is it going to be smaller stations? We're really excited about our, our next generation nuclear plant, these small modular nuclear plants, which would be about 300 megawatts. Do you, do you imagine these being in places where they're going to support, you know, whether it's these fueling stations or, you know, you're going to need maybe more distributed electricity. So we're really interested, but we're, and we're talking with folks as we think about, you know, this new model of electricity production and how much of that is going to be renewables versus how much of that's going to be a molecule, you know, and, and we really think of this as a portfolio solution. There's not one technology. It's going to be turbines. It's going to be, you know, uh, wind, it's going to be nuclear, it's going to be energy storage. We're going to need all of this to solve this problem together. Recently, I read that the U S government had awarded some contracts for power in space. Um, have you guys started thinking about that? Are you part of these initiatives? No, we are uh, literally our feet are planted firmly on the ground, Chris. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out who it is that's doing it because I, there was a contract for power on the moon that, that I saw go out from the U.S. government. No, no, I, my, my feet are firmly planted on terrestrial power generation. Sorry, can't help you there. All right. So going back, because as we come to a close on the program, um, you, you told us pretty exciting news. So there's a new vertical coming out. So GE is reinventing itself to, to the, today's market, right? That's kind of what I heard you say. It's more of a greener, new, green, new, I guess is your, 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 your word um, segment. You've got a vertical that handles it. You just mentioned in your kind of segment, you know, the different verticals there. Um, and and you talked about there, the timing seems to be pretty good with government policy that this administration got signed and got out. So it's saying, hey, there's a bunch of incentive for years to come to make hydrogen and, and other renewables in, in good space. Where are your customers in North America along the journey, right? Because they have these assets they built in the old model, which means you build an asset and you have your plant forever. Well, virtual power plants, solar and all that's distributed and the ROI on them can't be a 30-year plant investment. It's a very short. So where's the industry on this transition for, for the big, you know, the ISOs and the power producers and the folks that have legacy infrastructure, the big nuclear plants, not the modular stuff that we're talking about now? Uh, you know, I'll speak to the gas turbine uh, segment because that's really the customer base I know well. And, you know, for many customers who, who have installed gas turbines that are operating, you know, the questions that we ask regularly are, what are the technologies we can help bring to bear that will help them decarbonize those assets so they can keep running, supporting the grid, supporting the customers, but do so with, with you know, a lower carbon intensity. And, um, you know, the answer that we keep providing them is really twofold. It's, you know, we could think about, as we've talked a lot about the pre-combustion, you know, fuels like hydrogen, or... You know, we're doing a lot of work with customers around carbon capture. You know, what does it take to install a carbon capture system on the back end of a gas turbine? Again, talking about making it real, we've got a project funded by the U.S. Department of Energy where we're, we're in the midst of a, a front-end engineering design study, a feed study, looking specifically at what it would take to, to retrofit a carbon capture system on an existing operating combined cycle plant. You know, we're working with Southern Company on that. So we're really engaged with our customers about, you know, what are their goals? When do they want to decarbonize? What technologies make the most sense given their portfolio? Um, and again, there's there's a portfolio of technology options. It's not just one. There's this range. And we're working with our customers, 
And for some customers, they think hydrogen makes more sense. For some customers, they're more interested in carbon capture. It depends on where they are, you know, kind of, you know, relative to, let's say, availability of renewables or availability of, of geologic space for, for carbon sequestration. But, you know, we're really focused on engaging with our customers, developing those technology solutions to provide to them. Um, so it's really exciting, but, you know, very, very active space. Which I think is great. And, I, and what I what I heard you say and what I really like is that we're seeing the energy industry and the transformation. And, I, and when we started off the show, we had a lot of guests on. We, we kind of had the mindset it's, it's going to change, but it's going to be in the same format. But what you're saying here is it's changing, but it's multiple. So you might have a storage on this one. You might have hydrogen on this one. You have a small turbine on the. So I think this is the kind of the idea of the whole transformation. And I think where we will see more, and especially in the next coming years now with the investments in the US on the subsidies to see all of these different areas where the proof points will be. And mm -hmm. I think that's gonna be extremely interesting because there's so many different areas that we're covering. And I think this will be a proof point as well. So I, I really think that was a good takeaway, but great uh, feedback. I really appreciate having you on. Yeah, Jeff, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, GE, for letting you come on. Thank you personally for coming on. And I'd be remiss because I know you mentioned at the beginning, we mentioned you're a podcaster. You have a podcast. We support fellow energy podcasts and renewable and sustainable podcasts. So maybe a, just a quick, tell us about your podcast for a couple seconds and how people find you. Sure. Uh, the podcast is called Cutting Carbon. Uh, you can find it on uh, any of your favorite uh, platforms, whether it be uh, Amazon, iTunes, Spotify. Um, we're actually in the process of recording our sixth season. Um, we focus on topics around the energy transition. Uh, we intentionally focus uh, our discussions with experts, but we want the conversation to be non-technical. We want to reach an audience who wants to learn more about geologic carbon sequestration or aviation, but don't have the technical background. So we really are intending the conversations to be um, at a level where you don't have to have a, you know, a high level engineering education to do this. And we've been lucky. We've talked about all sorts of topics. Again, it's called cutting carbon. Uh, look for season six, probably in the late October or November timeframe. Um, and we're going to talk infrastructure um, in this season. Each season's had a theme. So we've talked about policy and uh, non-gas turbine technologies and gas turbine technologies. So it's, it's been a lot of fun and I appreciate uh, being able to plug the podcast. Thank you. Of course. Well, thank you again for being on the podcast. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I look forward to bringing you back and having you at some of our events because I've just enjoyed getting to know you in the last few events that we've done together. So thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you both. And for our audience, you've enjoyed another episode of Insider's Guide to Energy. If you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe forward and don't forget to like and comment. Jeff will probably read your comments and probably reply. So please comment, see us on anywhere you get your podcasts or on YouTube. And we will talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.